Welcome to Power Up Memphis. I'm your host, Gail Jones Carson, the Vice President of Community and External Affairs for Memphis Light, Gas and Water. The aim of Power Up Memphis is to take you, our customers, on an inside tour of MLGW to share our programs and operations with you. And by doing so, we can all better understand how we function as your utility provider. Today's guests are David Williams, who is the Regional Director for Vitalin, and Dr. Zelfia Brown, who is MLGW's HR business partner. My guest this segment is David Williams, who is the Regional Director for Vitalin, which is formerly uh, Lifeblood, which is what I grew up knowing this organization for. So um, tell me, David, what exactly is Vitalin and what do you all do? So Vitalin is, is actually a nonprofit blood bank. Uh, like you mentioned, we used to be Lifeblood. Mm -hmm. uh, and back around 2016, 2018, mm -hmm. there was a transition. We became part of a national mm -hmm. blood bank that is now called Vitalant. And um, so we basically supply uh, blood, uh, plasma, platelets to Memphis area hospitals to make sure that patients uh, can A, live or live longer mm -hmm. or live a higher quality life. So um, tell me, why is it important for us to increase the numbers of volunteers to give to uh, to give blood. Sure. Well, you know, first, just to say, you know, every unit of blood that's donated mm -hmm. saves up to three lives. So just imagine, you know, and and we're very thankful for all the people who are currently blood donors, volunteer donors, mm -hmm. um, but. For every four units of blood that we deliver to a hospital to help mm -hmm. a patient, only one of those is donated locally. The rest come from around the country uh, as part of our national uh, inventory. So, so we need more people volunteering to donate blood locally so that we can be a more sustainable, mm -hmm. uh, have a more sustainable blood supply here from our own community. So why do you think we don't have more people giving? You know, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, in some cases, there's a, a, a fear of needles. Uh, in some cases, it's a mistrust of things in the healthcare system, like mm -hmm. we experienced with vaccinations. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are so many different reasons, but two thirds of our population is eligible to be a blood donor, but fewer than 3% donate. So 3% of the two thirds that are eligible donate. And so overall, it's about 15% of the Memphis Shelby County population that give? Well, it's about, I mean, it's about 3% of the population that are donors. That are donors. Yeah. And uh, of that, only um, of, the, of the donors that we do have, fewer than 15% are African-American donors. So we're, oh, that's, that's the we're hoping, you know, that we can uh, better engage the African-American community. And and so about 15% of African-Americans give in this area. Um, so what is it that, what is it that we can do to encourage African-Americans to give more and do African-Americans use more blood than any other population that we have. So, I, you know, on the utilization, it would take the hospitals that we supply to mm -hmm. be able to say what percentage of their patients are uh, African American. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I just go on, mm -hmm. you know, you know, proportionately, mm -hmm. you would think that uh, uh, it would be, uh, you know, comparable to the demographics of our community. So, do these numbers fluctuate from year to year? Do they are they about the same every year in they, the giving? They go down every year. Um, we get less every year. We get less donors every year, um, and you know, of course, a big chunk of that over the last three years was COVID, yeah. right? Because um, 
schools, churches, businesses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are our three biggies and uh, Schools were closed, so there were no school blood drives. Yeah. People were uh, worshiping virtually, mm -hmm. so uh, it's difficult to do drives at some of the churches. Uh, businesses, people were working remotely as much as they could. And even if people were at work, there were a lot of restrictions about being able to come onto the property and, and, and uh, yeah, interface with employees. So, um, so it's, it's been very tough the last two, three years, but things have begun to open back up and we're really thankful for that. It's making a difference. So where did you get most of the blood that's been donated from? Was it schools, from was it churches, was it uh, work sites? Churches are always number one. Oh, okay. Schools are typically number two. Mm -hmm. And then the business community, number three. But I will say, <laughs> that Memphis Light, Gas, and Water <laughs> really powers us up because mm -hmm. Memphis Light, Gas, and Water is the single largest uh, donor uh, in terms of their employees who donate uh, as volunteer blood donors in, in the Memphis area. And Nick Noman is the vice president at MLGW who, this is his baby. He pushes hard that we give uh, in order to support, support those in our community. So I want to give a shout out to Nick Noman. Nick is, Nick is awesome, <laughs> and you know each of the each of the locations that Memphis Light Gas and Water has, where we get to do blood drives, has a blood drive coordinator. Yeah. And just a few months ago, uh, we had the coordinators come by and have lunch, and they got to tour the the Vitalic facility and get to meet some of the staff members. So we wanted them to feel part of our family, just like they've made us feel part of yours. So what did they see when they did the tour? Uh, I think they were pretty impressed. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you, when, when, when they get to the uh, hospital services area where we have the inventory okay. and they see, you know, that we don't have as much as they, you know, you just tend to think, well, blood is going to be there, but it's only there if volunteers make it possible. So I think it it was a realization for them in terms of, you know, if it's not, if we don't get out there and get our team members to really step up and volunteer, there won't be blood in the, in that fridge for, for Vitalant to be able to get to the hospitals, for the hospitals to be able to help the patients. So just say, for example, we were close to running out or running out. So you'd have to get blood from around the country. Yeah, and you know, you think about right now the storms that are hitting the west coast and oh, you know, yes. if there's a hurricane in Louisiana, uh, you know, a big snowfall, if there's a tornado somewhere, you know, it just you think about with COVID the uh, uh what they call it supply chain, supply, you know, disruptions yes. and all that. Well that happens with the blood supply too. A couple of years ago when we had the really big uh, ice storm yeah. and it, you know, it was difficult for a week for us to be able to even get any blood in here. Um, uh, even, you know, FedEx, you know, was shut down for a day or two. And so it was really challenging to make sure we had a blood supply for our community. I mean, I just can't even imagine just closing my eyes and, and imagining that we don't have blood for our community. And, you know, another challenging thing, Gail, is that um, there are not all blood um, centers are the same. Yeah. And so we're regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. So they pretty much dictate what we can and cannot do with regard to blood donation. But the Food and Drug Administration, uh, they only allow volunteer donated blood to be infused into a patient in a hospital. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our community has other types of centers, plasma centers, uh, for-profit blood banks. And when somebody goes there and they're paid for the blood or the plasma that they donate, mm -hmm. that cannot be trans transfused into a patient in the hospital. 
that's used for pharmaceutical research, oh, it's shipped overseas. So when when somebody donates with Vitalant mm -hmm. or another nonprofit blood bank that works with volunteers, then that blood can be transfused into a patient. So if somebody wants to help a loved one, a family member, a neighbor, a, a church member, you know, then they need to be sure that they're donating as a volunteer. Okay. That's what makes a big difference. So what is the process? If I decide I want to give blood, what is the process? They simply go to our uh, website or they could call our toll-free number or they can even walk in to one of our donor centers. And we've got five in the Memphis area. Mm -hmm. And um, they just, you know, uh, come in and donate. So there's no challenges to uh, just giving blood, but you definitely test the blood some kind of way before it's given out. Right. It's a very great question because, mm -hmm. um, you know, when somebody does come in, they do have a questionnaire. There are mm -hmm. some things to determine whether somebody is or isn't eligible. But like I said, two-thirds of the population is eligible to donate. Mm -hmm. But once somebody does donate, um, you know, it takes about 48 hours oh. before we've had a chance to really thoroughly test, make sure that the blood is okay. safe, uh, be able to deliver it to a hospital uh, so that it can be uh, used to help a patient. So um, when you think about, like, um, not too long ago, there was a, a shooting at a grocery store. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, people who wanted to give blood to be able to help people who were impacted as a result of that shooting, mm -hmm. you know, that was not the blood that was going to help somebody oh. right then and there. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was going to help that person in about two days. two days. So that's why we say it's the blood on the shelves that saves lives. Because okay. when somebody's wheeled into the emergency room or somebody needs uh, blood right then and there, you know, when the doctor says, hey, I need, you know, this type of blood, and you've seen the scenes on TV, you know, you, it, they got to go get the blood right then. They can't wait 48 hours. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, I, I want to thank you very much, um, David, for coming on the show and sharing this very important information for our viewing audience. And I'm hoping that as people have heard what you've had to share, that many of them will open up their hearts and their minds to give more blood uh, for the Memphis and Shelby County community. Thank you, Gail. And thanks for all that Memphis Light, Gas, and Water does for us, too. How prepared you are for a power outage is the difference between a stressful situation and a minor inconvenience. Make an emergency plan. Pack a kit with first aid supplies, bottled water, and a flashlight. And stay informed using the MLGW outage map on your laptop or mobile device. To report a power outage, gas leak, or downed line, just give us a call. Be prepared and stay connected by using the MLGW app and follow us on social media. A little prep goes a long way. MLGW, serving you is what we do. So we're going to be discussing some of the hiring processes and recruitment at Memphis Light Gas and Water, and the guest today is Dr. Zelfia Brown. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us today. So uh, tell us how MLGW attracts engineers and other professionals to the organization. All right. There are a lot of things that we do, but I'll focus on a few areas. Uh, one of the main things that we do, we always continue to review our pay structure, our benefits, and our flexible work practices to make sure that we are making decisions that are going to be in the best interest of our current and our future employees, and to also make sure that we remain competitive in this environment. Uh, the other thing that we do, we are doing more partnerships. So for some, we are reconnecting with those that we have partnered with in the past. We're also creating new partnerships with uh, local and regional entities so that we can let them know about the offerings that we have and getting them to share that information with their base. And then finally, the other thing that we do, we're also looking to expand our sourcing 
that we do so that we can cast a broader net and also have a more specified net to maybe go and look in particular industries when we need engineers, perhaps reaching out and sourcing to industry trade magazines and things of that nature, as well as participating in job fairs that may give us a more general uh, clientele. So could you define sourcing as you mentioned a couple of times? All right, absolutely. So sourcing is how we get our applicants. Mm -hmm. So that's just a way for us to get them. Uh, depending upon the skill set that we need for those applicants, it could be, like I said, if we need someone that just has general skill, we might source, we may just put an ad on our website or we may place an ad somewhere else. Uh, if we need someone that has a particular technical skill, which we could go about placing that on our website, which we do, but we could also target, maybe we need a skilled professional with a specific uh, knowledge base. Mm -hmm. We would then seek those trade magazines, uh, maybe going to some of their conferences to let them know about the offerings that we have. Okay, so based on us dealing with this pandemic the last two and a half years, how have we been able to remain competitive? Uh, offering the flexible work arrangements has definitely been a way for us to uh, maintain being competitive. Also continuing to offer development opportunities during the pandemic, we might not have been able to travel or there might not have been as many offerings of professional development. So we have a wonderful MLGW University okay. where we do offer training opportunities. And also in the industry, we've been able to see that many organizations that did offer professional development to our employees, they had to change how they did business. So they started offering more remote opportunities to them and we made sure to make that available to our employees. Okay, so define your flexible working policy. Uh, in general, it is a policy where if the leadership determines that it is a position where there can be some flexibility either in uh, the number of days that someone reports to a physical facility, uh, if it's a change in the hours, uh, if there's a change in how the job is just done. Uh, and that's something that is determined by leadership. And then the leadership and the employees discuss what's going to be in the best interest of still serving our customers, but allowing them that flexibility to determine whether or not, well, do I need to come into this office every day? Uh, do I need to maybe stagger the time that I'm coming in? Uh, do I need specific resources at home in order to be as effective as I was in the organization? So there are some criteria, but it also is truly based on the need of the organization and how it's going to work to make sure that we can still service our customers. So for many, many years, Memphis Light, Gas and Water has not had a very high turnover. So uh, did that change during the pandemic? It was pretty much even kill. So because of the nature of the work that we do, mm -hmm. uh, people are going to always need utilities, they're going to need water, they're going to need electricity and gas and things of that nature. So we are actually seeing where more people were spending time at home mm -hmm. uh, using those resources. So, yeah. so we didn't really experience that, which is one of the reasons why we're talking now, because we still need people that are going to uh, do those things for us. The other thing is that because people do stay with us for uh, quite a while, they seek promotional opportunities. Yeah. So even when we have that kind of turnover, they're not leaving the organization, they're going to other departments, other areas, okay. and then we still need to fill that. So uh, we've been pretty good about that. That's, that's very good. I mean, I mean because um, one of the things I've always known about Memphis like Gas Water, I left and I came back many years later, is that it is a good place to work, uh, good pay, good benefits. And I'm glad to hear that you all have created additional re outlets to make sure employees continue to stay there and that we are able to recruit uh, quality candidates. So of all the professions we have, which one do you consider the most competitive for maintaining and recruiting? Um, it actually, it really, it, it truly does vary uh, because while we might have some positions 
that there are not as many as others, like for our call center. I mean, everyone knows they're the people that you reach out to when you have a question, if there needs to be a payment arrangement. Mm -hmm. While we have a large number of those individuals, uh, we still need them. Whereas with the engineers and other professionals may require a different skill set. So it's all about right sizing, making sure that we have the right uh, number and being flexible uh, with that. So we continue to monitor what's happening in the market. We listen to what our employees tell us about what they think uh, will be one of the better ways or some suggestions on better ways of doing things. So it's not just necessarily that there's one particular, because it, it truly does take all of us to make sure that we provide the service to our customers. It's just more or less about getting that right balance of making sure that if we need XYZ number of engineers, if we need XY number of people in the call center, the utility workers, the linemen, it's about making sure that we keep that mix and perfect balance. And, and as you mentioned, some of those job titles, <clears throat> one of the things some people may not know is that at Memphis Light Gas and Water, we have almost every profession. We do. Accountants and journalists, Absolutely. communication folks. Marketing, like, marketing, all of that good stuff. Lawyers. <laughs> exactly. So we have a wide range of professions at Memphis Light Gas and Water, and people don't have to leave Memphis to get a good job and good pay. And, Absolutely. Uh, good benefits. So um, how, how, what is the process for a person who wants to work for Light Gas and Water? What is the process for him or her to follow? Right. So we have our wonderful website, MLGW.com. Mm -hmm. If you go to the bottom of the screen, you'll see where there are job opportunities. You can also just go straight to um, our, you could go to that website that is going to be jobs.mlgw.org, which will take you to the same place if you go to the main website and then click opportunities. And you'll have an opportunity to see what we have available. If you know you're looking for a specific type of job, maybe you are looking for something in accounting, mm -hmm. or if you're looking for something in customer service or in engineering, then you can search that using the search engine. And we are moving to using Taleo, which is a wonderful uh, tool that is going to really streamline and make a uh, a more intuitive experience for the job seeker by being able to search for those specific keywords or jobs oh. and things of that nature. If you're not quite sure what you're looking for, you can select to look at all of our offerings and you will go through, you'll see a general description of what those positions are. And then if you're interested, you click on it and then you enter the information. You will have to create an account mm -hmm. uh, so that you can have your own profile, mm -hmm. uh, answer the questions, and that will be your profile to come back. If, if you see something else, you won't be starting from scratch. You just go in, you do your okay. search, you take that information, and then you submit whatever documents uh, are listed as far as what you would have to. So it's a very uh, intuitive, uh, very end user friendly kind of process. That's good to know. That's good to know. So are there any internship opportunities at MLGW? Absolutely. We have internship and co-op oh, uh, co opportunities okay. <laughs> uh, as well. You would go to the same place and you would look for those opportunities that are listed. Um, and so that is also a great way to source uh, to get employees because that gives them an opportunity to experience uh, work in our environment, real life kinds of you know practical things. You're taking what you learned in class from theory and you're putting it to work. You're also getting that benefit of meeting different people within the organization, making your connections. And those are some of the things, and I'm definitely a big proponent of education, but there's also room for practical application, meeting people, networking, making connections, and also, like you stated, keeping the talent here in Memphis because we do have those opportunities. Okay, so to define the difference uh, between co-op and intern. Uh, in general, a co-op is going to be someone that is right at graduation. Mm -hmm. uh, they are going to generally work anywhere 30 to 40 hours. They're generally like in that last semester that's there. So when you say graduate, you mean from college? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Graduating from college. Okay. The interns generally work with, and they're going to do that for several months, those people that are serving as the co-ops, because they, they're just about 
you know, done with everything. Okay. With the interns, they generally are going to work like in the summertime. There may be opportunities when it's outside of that window, but it's more or less like kind of like the summer kind of intern where they're going to come in and they're going to do the same kinds of work. It's just going to be for a a shorter period of time and they are not expected to have graduated or to be close to graduating from right. college. It's just another great way for them, of course, to earn some income, mm -hmm. but to get some great experience and also for us to keep our eyes on them to say, hey, you know what? Uh, make sure you keep MLGW at the top of your list when you are looking for career opportunities. So we actually do hire some of the interns and possible co-ops who've gone through our training? We actually do. We do. We love to hire them uh, because we already know that they're a pretty good fit for our culture, that they have the skill set and the knowledge base. They've been able to come in and contribute and that's something that we love to do with our interns and co-ops. We just don't give them busy work. We're giving them things that really will add value and to make them feel connected to the organization. Of course, we reap the benefit as well of getting the skill set that we need, but making those connections and building those long lasting relationships. And if on the off chance they decide to go outside of the area, they can serve as our ambassadors by telling the people at their institutions or family members, hey, you know what, this is a great opportunity. You should look into this and giving us that information as well. Okay, great. So as we wind down, Zelfia, Dr. Z, <laughs> what would you like to tell our viewing audience about the hiring process or the opportunities at Memphis Light, Gas, and Water? Well, one of the key things that I would really like to share has to do with MLGW. We recognize that our people, it's not some kind of trope, it's not some kind of trite saying. We truly do recognize that our employees are our greatest assets. Mm -hmm. No one else can be you, no one else can be me. Mm -hmm. We bring our uniqueness to the organization and the organization truly appreciates that. We do value diversity and inclusion. We make sure that we get feedback and input from all of our employees, not just from select and not just going through a process of, okay, well, we've heard you, now let's make our own decisions. It's really to bring them along to to help them to shape the organization because they are a reflection of our community. We also are committed to providing growth opportunities. You don't just, if you choose to stay in your role, you can absolutely stay in the role that you are in, but we're gonna give you opportunity for growth, for development, and things of that nature. Once again, we're still offering very competitive kinds of benefits, pay structures, the flexible work arrangements, and uh, tuition assistance, those kinds of things to, to really help us out. And we wanna make sure that everyone knows we also are a very corporate responsible kind of, of organization. We do thousands of hours, our employees, we go yes. out and we do things uh, with the food banks and with food drives, uh, anything, any kind, there are a lot of opportunities and the employees can get to do that while they are quote unquote on the clock mm -hmm. because they're doing it in the name of MLGW and we recognize that we need to serve in exactly. the community that we are privileged to service in. That is so true. We, our employees give a lot of hours working in our community, serving our community. So Dr. Zelfia Brown, I want to thank you very much for sharing information about our hiring process and recruitment uh, at Memphis Light Gas for Water. Thank you. My pleasure. You're watching the Library Channel, a broadcast service of the Memphis Public Libraries and the City of Memphis.